Hello and welcome to Brightwood Christian Church. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. This is December 13th, 2020. It is Joy Sunday. And um, it used to be that Advent was treated much like Lent in the life of the church. So people fasted and prayed in a special way. They refrained from doing things they enjoyed until it was time to celebrate at Christmas. But on Joy Sunday, you kind of got to take the day off and really um, just celebrate and let the season in. And so even though this has become more of a joyous season the whole time, um, we especially celebrate Joy Sunday and we are joyful that you're worshiping with us. So you're gonna see in today's worship, our imagery is a lot of kids. Um, I don't know that there is anything more joyful than kids at Christmas. You'll also see some pets, um, not ours. We, we use stock images here just to keep everybody in line, but um, the, the images of pets are just to acknowledge that we know so many of you um, certainly consider uh, pets like your kiddos. And so I know that they bring us a lot of joy um, and keep an eye out for probably the most hilarious cat I've ever seen, who uh, the kid who's holding him looks really happy and this cat really does not. It's like the Scrooge of all cats. I also wanna celebrate with you that um, we were able to incorporate special music today. And I really want to thank Rick Campbell and Lisa Powell. Um, Rick is our vocalist and Lisa is our organist and pianist at Brightwood. And they do such a great job. And so I'm just so thankful for their talents. I want to encourage my folks that um, if you want to be a part of our worship service, touch base with us and we'll try to see how we can make that happen. I want to invite you further in, um, into the life of the church and you can find out ways to do that on our website, brightwoodchurch.org. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We really try a couple of times a week at least to give you something inspirational or celebratory or thought-provoking, and so you can find us there. I, I just hope that we're a part of the specialness of this season, and um, it's strange, we know, to, to not be together in the way we're used to this Advent season. But I cling to that longing. Um, I pray that that longing is still within all of us when we're able to be together again. And I pray that that longing is something that we can talk to other people about, how much we love church, why we miss our church, what we love about being in worship instead of just um, worshiping through our online venues. And so um, maybe consider taking that pain and using it as a tool for evangelism, just to share your story about why worship matters to you. May God bless you this week, and may you have so much joy. We want everything to look nice. The decorations of the season are homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, to bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it's tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of the season, not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things. The beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Come festively sing while awaiting the birth. Join angels in dancing from heaven to earth. Wave banners of good news, lift high thankful praise. One candle is lit for the joy of these days. Will you join me as we call ourselves to worship? The promised one of God brings good news to the oppressed and binds up the brokenhearted. We are witnesses to the light of Christ. The promised one of God proclaims liberty to captives and release to prisoners. We are witnesses to the light of Christ. The promised one of God comforts all who mourn and gives a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. Rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, holding fast to what is good, we are witnesses to the light of Christ. Will you enter into a spirit of prayer with me? We thank you, O God, for all those in Scripture who have pointed to Christ, for your prophets Elijah and Isaiah, and for other prophets, and for John. We thank you, too, for those in our lives who have pointed us to Christ, pastors and teachers, strangers and friends. Give us eyes to see him today among those who are oppressed, imprisoned, brokenhearted, or beaten down, and we will give our testimony, too. How Christ releases and sets free, how he turns ashes into garlands, how he repairs and builds up what was ruined. We, too, will point others to Jesus, the light of the world. We pray it in his name, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O oh, come ye, O oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exultation. Sing, all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. Hear him, Christ the Lord. Child for us sinners, poor and in the manger, we would embrace thee with love and awe. Who would not love thee, loving us so dear? Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born for our salvation. Jesus, to thee be all glory give. Word of the Father, now in flesh.
flesh appearing. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Will you enter into a spirit of prayer with me as we pray for God's people? God who restores, you have done great things for us and we rejoice. So often you have filled us with laughter, even turning tears of sadness into shouts of joy. You send prophets who point the way to justice and show the way to you. We thank you for sending good news to us and repairing so much that we have devastated. In this season of light, we lift up in prayer so many who wait in darkness people oppressed by poverty and discrimination, by political upheaval or dangerous rulers, people imprisoned wrongly and also those imprisoned justly. Right what is wrong among us and in us and restore us to you, to others, to ourselves. Make the brokenhearted whole again. Comfort those who mourn. Repair our ruined cities. In all the jostling and jingling of these days, do not let us lose sight of you or those whom you especially came to serve, people who are in need of healing, people who are overlooked or underserved, the ones who are lost and the ones we have made to feel little and least. Light of the world, live among us always, full of grace and truth. Amen. I know it's strange to celebrate Joy Sunday in the midst of a global pandemic. Our state just closed down in-person dining again and gyms. Um, not that that was really an issue for me, honestly. Um, but most of our schools are closed. We are, we're frustrated and disappointed and we're scared and we're grieving either someone that we've lost due to COVID-19 or, or something we're losing because of how we're having to respond to it. And as we approach the table, the scripture that comes to mind for me today is Psalm 23, where it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I think about that scripture a lot. And I think that might have been the same table that Jesus pulled himself up to on that last night when facing death almost immediately, and surrounded by those who would deny or betray him, he still broke the bread and blessed it. At any table, in the midst of any circumstance, it can be a feast when it's prepared by God. It can still be a joyous celebration of what is good, of what we have, and of the memories of what God has done for us. So this is such a table. We're at such a table together, wherever, whenever we are. And all who believe in Jesus are invited to rejoice there and to partake. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave a prayer of thanksgiving for it, and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave a prayer of thanksgiving for it, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the, the covenant, new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Truly, I tell you, said Jesus, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Will you pray with me? Great deliverer, how wondrous are your deeds. You created the world and all that's in it. With a mighty arm, you parted the waters and led your people to liberation. When we were in exile, you gathered us up in your bosom and led us home like a mother sheep. When we were mistreating our own, you sent us prophets to set us right. You pulled down the arrogant and lifted up the weak. And when the time was right, you sent us Jesus to set us free. Now through this feast, send us again your life-giving spirit and recharge your promise within us. 
as we joyously and eagerly await our Savior to come again from heaven. Amen. Angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Scripture for today is Luke 1, 46b through 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the loneliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever.
God is good and all the time. So we're working from back to front a little bit here today. Um, in today's scripture, we're listening to Mary's song about welcoming Jesus, but it's a, an earlier scripture when we actually hear the angel tell her she's going to have this baby. And we'll be talking about that next week. Um, but this song that Mary sings, often called the Magnificat, is so joyful. I just really wanted to celebrate it today, in part because it isn't an easy joy. And we're all finding um, that right now. How, how do we find that difficult joy? You know, one of the most popular Christmas songs, um, I think that people know, that's maybe more religious, uh, that gets played on the radio a lot during the season is Mary, Did You Know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? And on and on. And I feel like today's scripture is the answer. I think that in looking more closely at what Mary knew, we can come to some pretty wonderful knowledge ourselves. The knowledge of how to be joyful even in the midst of the terrible. I know my sermon title sort of gave the answer away, but yes, I think Mary knew. I mean, you can't know everything, right? I think every parent faces that. They know there is a baby. Maybe they've practiced changing diapers, but you always learn as you go. Um, the specific questions that the song asks, I don't know that Mary knew. She didn't necessarily know that Jesus would walk on water. She didn't know that he would calm a storm. What she knew was who Jesus was and what it would mean for God's people. In fact, not only did she know, but her cousin Elizabeth knew it too. At this point in Luke's telling of the story of the birth of Jesus, Mary has been visited by the angel Gabriel and she's conceived by the Holy Spirit. And remembering what Gabriel told her about her cousin Elizabeth, also conceiving, she traveled to go see her. And as soon as Mary steps into the door, the child in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy within her. And the Holy Spirit comes upon Elizabeth and Elizabeth shouts, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. There's two different kinds of blesseds in there that, that the scripture uses. And, and that last one, and blessed is she who believed, is the same one that Jesus would later use in the Beatitudes. Happy are they, is what we sometimes hear. Blessed are they who mourn all those rhythms. Uh, happy are they. So we already see that, um, that, that Elizabeth's prophecy is calling Mary not only blessed, but joyful. And this prophecy from Elizabeth couldn't have come at a better time. Mary had to be overwhelmed and afraid and excited like any mother to be, um, except a million times more because of how this process came about and to whom this child would ultimately belong. And she came to that door not knowing what kind of reception she might get. Elizabeth, um, maybe she'd heard the rumors about Mary. We don't know how Mary was being accepted at this point, but certainly if, if word had started to get out that Mary um, was with child, it would be unusual for Elizabeth to greet her this way. It would have been much more likely for Mary's family to shun her. But by greeting her with honor, Elizabeth is overturning social norms of the time. And by doing that, just like in Mary's song, the lowly are uplifted and Mary is made to feel welcome and at home and not alone. It was especially important that it was Elizabeth who knew because Mary and Elizabeth were both living in the shadow of shame. 
Elizabeth had felt shamed for being at such an advanced age and not having children yet. I know that's painful to hear, but unfortunately, at the time, this was seen as a sign that you had done something wrong and were being punished by God. Thankfully, we know that that's not the case now. She would have felt very isolated from her peers, though, and, and very likely judged by her community. What had Elizabeth done to, to deserve that? And that's, that's a question Elizabeth would have had to walk with for a long time. So by acknowledging that Mary was going through all of this, um, and, and by the faith that it took for Mary to say yes to God, by Elizabeth acknowledging that, it gave Mary the space to celebrate in a way that she might not have been comfortable doing around the folks at home who were never going to understand. Elizabeth's words and the prenatal John jump for joy um, also starts something beautiful. Judith Jones writes, by declaring both Mary and the fruit of Mary's womb blessed, Elizabeth begins a series of blessings that weave through Luke's birth narrative and intensify its tone of joy and delight and praise. Mary, Zechariah, and Simeon will all add their blessings to the chain, praising God for what God is doing at this moment in history and recognizing that those who are privileged to be instruments of God's saving work have been richly blessed. So things are good so far, right? Mary has gone to Elizabeth's house and even the unborn baby is happy to see her. And so Mary breaks into song. And this may seem strange to you if you don't break into song a lot or if you haven't watched a lot of musicals. Uh, maybe since you're home more often these days, maybe you break into song more. I know it's happening a lot at my house. Um, but here's Mary and what does she sing but this well-known verse that's today's scripture. But it. It isn't exactly catchy, is it? You might not have been able to tell it was a song. Well, not all poetry has to rhyme, I guess, but what did this song do, do you think, to deserve writer C.S. Lewis calling it a, quote, terrible song? I feel like you've got to really have guts <laughs> to uh, critique the mother of God's songwriting chops. But he really wasn't making fun of her rhyming scheme. He was playing on the Latin word terribilis, which means dreadful, frightful, or fearsome. Why would this bit of scripture be fearsome? After all, Jana, didn't you just say it was Joy Sunday? And it does start out positive. My soul magnifies the Lord, that magnificat, that's where that comes from. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Of course, the song is mostly about how God has been good to Mary and how God has been good to all of God's people. And it stays joyful, but it's a complex and difficult joy because what Mary is celebrating here is the end of the whole social order. She sings, he has shown me strength, shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lonely. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So if you are one of the proud, powerful or rich, you might not have found yourself singing along. The kind of world Mary is celebrating doesn't get born easily and without pain. Nothing does. And by singing these things, she's showing that she knows exactly who this child is because this reversal of fortune, the low being raised up, comes from exactly one place. Scriptures about the Messiah. Now, it isn't an entirely original song. First Samuel tells us the story of Hannah. If you remember Hannah's story, Hannah conceived a child after years of of being a, unable to have children and being severely mocked by her husband's other wife. And she gave birth to Samuel. And when he was very young, she gave him to God by giving him to Eli to train as a priest. It's a song of painful joy as she celebrates the miracle that Samuel is and then relinquishes him to God for God's purposes. 
It may sound familiar. Listen to the echoes of Mary's song in this earlier song from Hannah. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no, no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren have been born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries, shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Remember, Messiah means anointed one. And it was Hannah's son, Samuel, who would eventually anoint David as king of Israel. Just as later, Mary would sing a similar song as she bore the anointed one of God who would become king of the world. Both of these songs are sung by women who were downtrodden and lonely, and yet God raised them up. Scott Hosey puts it this way. What happened to me, Mary as much sang in her terrible song, is a sign of what will happen to the whole universe one day. Did Mary know? Did she know that her son would be great? Yes. Did she know everything that he would suffer? I don't know that she did. It isn't in her song. But she knew her scripture. That's part of why we hear those echoes of Hannah's song in her own. And she knew the stories of the Messiah. And she likely knew the danger he would face in being part of something that would help God to bring down the thrones of the powerful. Other people had tried. She'd seen what had happened. And she sang anyway. And I'll tell you, I think she wants us to sing too. Despite the struggles she was surely facing, you can hear in her song the celebration of who God has been to his people throughout history. You can hear the excitement she has in being a part of what God is doing. You can hear the gratitude for what God has done for her. And I think that that is where we find our own joy in the midst of all life's circumstances. It isn't the same as happiness. It is the welling up of something deeper than that. Maybe some combination of meaning and delight that helps us profoundly appreciate and savor the gifts around us while calling us to see where we can be of use in God's scheming. I'd invite you in response to that joy to sing this week. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Sing while you're doing dishes. Sing in the shower. Sing yourself to sleep. Turn on the Christmas music or the big band or the country and sing. Sing with Mary and Hannah and the angels, even if your joy is only a dim flicker in a dark world. Sing anyway.